If there's one thing I like to talk about, and I talk a lot, it's talking about Honda in the 1980s and the 1990s. Because I would argue that Honda was easily the greatest motorcycle manufacturer in the world during the second half of the 20th century. And I'm not even a Honda fanboy. These days, the inline four engine is synonymous with Japan, and for good reason. They pretty much developed them into high powered, high revving racing beasts over the course of four decades. These days, easily pushing 200 horsepower in frames lighter than anything you've seen before them. I mean, think about it, right? Back in the day, I mean, like the 90s and the early 2000s, if you wanted something that broke speed records, you had to get a fat heavy pig of a bike displacing well over a liter, sometimes up to 1.4 liters in the case of Kawasaki. But let me back up because I'm getting ahead of myself. The prevalence of the inline four engine can be traced back to 1969 through none other than Honda. It's not that Honda up and created the first ever four cylinder, but think about the 1960s. Best bikes out at that time were from British brands like Triumph and of course from America with brands like Harley Davidson. But the bikes out of Britain and the US were lumpy, leaky, and more or less unrefined machines. These bikes still sold well because, well, <laughs> that was simply what the idea of motorcycling was back then. You take your two cylinder motorcycle, you kickstart it once or twice or ten times, you leak a little bit of oil, you hope you valves are inspect for the day and you let your hands and feet go numb from the vibes and hope to god that nothing falls off or out of the damn thing on the highway. It was a man sport and it was fine. And you know what? Japan fell in line with that two cylinder British ethos, albeit generally with improved technology sometimes trading push rods for overhead cams, kick starts for electric starts and using split crankcases, uh, clever valve train systems and overall just better finishes. Now imagine if you take that much better built bike with all those bells and whistles and you add two cylinders to it in a world that only really seen four cylinder engines in racing motorcycles or you know, high-end street bikes from time to time. That is the CB750. And I feel like the CB750 is so brilliant that it's pretty much a dead horse to talk about it at this point. But you have to understand something here. Honda came out of left field with the inline 4 in 1969 as a super successful power move and basically standardized the engine type for the next 40 years. And with that said, they actually tried to pull the same move again in 1982. As the other uh, Japanese manufacturers had begun to board the inline 4 train throughout the 1970s and into the 80s, Honda was actually looking for a ticket to a different wagon. You know, not looking too aggressively, but you know, just kind of thinking about it. You know, tossing the idea around to those who'd listen but still bookending the conversation with, oh yeah, keep that, keep that all low key, please. And Honda's philosophy always had a strong link between racing and the street. They were somewhere between believing that what wins on the track today sells in the showrooms tomorrow, and also feeling compelled to race using technology that they already sold. Since they were out of the 500 class GP racing for about 10 years by 1977, due to being insistent on building four strokes in a two stroke dominated class, they felt that they had to jump back in with something big, you know, make a big bang. See, 500 class racers were limited to four cylinders, but the cycle type didn't matter, meaning that manufacturers could run sugar rush and cracked out two strokes like they had been for years. And since Mr. Honda actually actively hated two strokes, Honda would have to do something kind of crazy to get a four stroke viable in his class. See, that's where the v <laughs> See, this is where the V4 comes in. Well, sort of. It's a V4, but technically it's a little baby V8. Yeah. It was a 1979 Honda NR500. It had the mandated four cylinders, but Honda got real cheeky with the rules for this one because the pistons were oval shaped with two con rods each and then eight valves per cylinder for a total of 32 valves. 32 freaking valves. I mean, most modern four bangers have four valves per cylinder, and Yamaha Genesis based engines like mine and the FZ1 have five valves per pot, but eight? You can see why this is literally a tiny V8 that simply has two merged pistons on all four corners. With this setup, the flow of intake and exhaust was incredibly efficient. Uh, theoretically, it flowed as well as a two stroke, and it was genius because there were no rules against cylinder shape. <laughs> I mean, think about that. What board of directors would have ever had the foresight to think, yeah, we should probably mandate circular cylinders just in case, right? Now, don't get me wrong. This bike flopped harder than LeBron James getting yeah. breathed on. I mean, it was so damn radical that it ended up being unreliable even in the rare times that it was actually competitive. Honda got knocked on his ass so hard that when he got back up, it had lost two engine cycles and a cylinder. That was officially the white flag when they, you know, tossed in the NS500. It was sad to see, but Honda had given up on the V4 route, at least in GP racing they did. At the same time, 1982 was ironically the start of the wave of V4-powered road bikes from Honda. Right, the VF line of bikes. This is genesis for the relationship between Honda and the V4 power plant on the road. The Dino Room. Weak machines fear it. Once harnessed to the dynamometer, there are no secrets. Its V4 power seems immeasurable. The power of magna. All the power you'll ever need. You can kind of see how much stock they put into V4 engines because despite the fact that the V4 that they ran in GP was getting absolutely destroyed, they were still pushing this philosophy. The VF line, uh, the original VF line, came with uh, sporty standard options and cruiser options in the form of the Sabres and the Magnas respectively. Although some of the smaller standards didn't carry the Sabre name and then some of the bigger ones 
Instead, we're called interceptors later on, and sometimes it just depends on your market. It's honestly a little bit confusing, especially when you start talking about the VFRs too. For standard bikes in the early to mid 80s, you could opt for 400 or 500 for entry levels, on up to 700, 750s, 1000s, and 1100s depending on your market and the year due to tariffs, and the range is mostly the same for Magnus, with a few exceptions. Now this calls back to the CB line of bikes from the 60s and early 70s, because remember, you could get a CB in any displacement that, that math and our number system would allow for. The folks at Honda were pushing the idea that a V4 was the best of both worlds, combining low down torque of a twin and a rush of power from an inline four. The engines featured four valves per cylinder, dual overhead cams, liquid cooling, which was necessary due to the rear cylinders not seeing as much air, and generally six-speed transmissions, even in the smaller models. Engines of the same displacement would be practically interchangeable if not for differences in drive formats between some Sabres and some Magnus. The angle and format mean that the uh, engines were perfectly balanced and this allowed for minimal vibrations without even needing to use a counterbalance. But let me tell you something about Honda. They will stake a racing season on unproven technology and do so in the name of innovation. Honda didn't like failure, but they were more curious than they were a sore loser. So they'll flop a season or two to find out what works and what doesn't work. But God forbid they sell you, the customer, an unreliable bike. <laughs> heavens no. Well, heavens yes, because the original VF line of bikes was revealed to have camshafts that would turn themselves into dust. This was a scarily common issue spawning the nickname of chocolate cams. Remember, Honda was and still is known for quality and reliability. It's established now, but back then, Honda was on top of the world and they couldn't risk losing that reputation. So, what did they do? <laughs> well, they crossed their arms and said, not our fault. Yep, real classy. They were still sweating on the inside, so even though they never issued a recall, formally and legally admitted the responsibility, they also did the repairs for free, but only if <laughs> the, no the owners discovered the extreme wear soon enough. It's basically you had to check your shaft every now and then, and if you saw a weird rash, uh, I mean pitting, you had to bring it in before your engine goes. Honda didn't really oblige, and on top of that, Honda then scrambled to release one of the most overbuilt, bulletproof line of bikes they ever made, the VFR. To get specific about the cams in the VFR, <laughs> this time they were revised and gear-driven. Overcompensation? Yeah. In business, they call out a power move. Them cams? Your fault. But we're not above helping you. <laughs> By the way, this bike here is indestructible. Are you distracted yet? Good. <laughs> so the VFR 750 begins the VFR timeline, and it's an interesting bike because Honda could have made it an all-out sport bike to tackle the GSXR 750 of the time, but instead they made it more of a sport Toro, still homologating the RC30 for WSBK. There was also the VFR 700, but that was more or less an identical bike with less displacement just to get around the ridiculous tariff on imported bikes over 700cc in the United States, so let's just reference the um, 750. Oh, see, the VFR 750 was much more much more bike than a VF 750. It was lighted by nearly 50 pounds and up around 20 horsepower from its liquid cooled dual overhead cam 16 valve V4 engine with the super trick gear driven cam system, given that uh, signature whine juxtaposed by that growl. Now this bike was just on point. It featured a modern style twin spar frame, which is something not even a beloved GSXR had back in 86. Showa forks and shocks, and the models from 1986 to 1989 were cool, but I think the ones that everyone knows and likes more are the models that start from 1990 with the redesigned bodywork. 1990 was also the first year for the single-sided swing arm, uh, and it set the DNA for the VFR all the way to now. This model had a lower set engine, which improved handling, and the forks were improved, and the wheels were widened, giving the VFR a much better stance. The VFR 750 was lauded for its reliability, its comfort, and its absolute top-of-the-line quality. I was joking around earlier about the reliability scandal, but I was also serious. Honda overbuilt this bike to hell to make a point. Nowadays, you can find VFRs of 100,000 miles going strong. In 1994, Honda made a few changes to keep the bike fresh, as the overall design still dated back to 1986. They changed the brakes, the tank, the suspension, and they redesigned the fairings to reflect their V4 Halo bike, the 92 NR750, that oval piston beautiful monstrosity. This final update for the, for the 750 lasted until 1997 before the 750 was replaced by the VFR 800 in 1998. The VFR 800 was a completely different bike from the 750 in many ways. The engine wasn't actually a simple board job, it was more of a revision of the V4 out of the RC45. This time around you had the fuel injection, two side mounted radiators, and a goofy <laughs> combined braking system where if you applied the front brake you got a little bit of back brake too and vice versa. I mean, who asked for that? 
I mean, I don't know, I like getting my skit on, so I destroyed the system in a heartbeat. Gear the gear-driven cam system carried over, albeit in a different location in the engine, and a single-sided swing arm and a conventional forks also carried over from the 750. This body style of VFR was actually very short-lived, and with good reason, because I think it's pretty ugly compared to the 750 and the later 800 that came after it. Obviously, the performance was improved, but I think it looks a little disproportionate. What do you think? I mean, at least this thing still sounded fucking crazy when you threw a system on it. In 2002, Honda introduced the 6th generation of the VFR, and it was still running the 800cc lump like the previous ugly version, but all new for 2002 was some rather handsome bodywork that actually still holds up even today in 2021. Also most notably, the VTEC system, because the VFR line was unofficially the platform for Honda to try new and crazy things to put on a motorcycle. I mean, we all like the VFR enough for the quality, the smoothness, the sound, the racing pedigree, but Honda always had a gimmick to add to them, which I guess adds to the charm. In any case, the engine runs on two valves per cylinder below 6800 RPM and switches to 4 above that blah blah yeah. The thing is, it's fine in a car, you get that kick, but really who wants that abrupt kick while on a bike, you know, where balance is literally everything. They later made the VTEC transition smoother after a whole bunch of criticism because, well, I mean, who wants VTEC to kick you in the ass in the middle of a corner? Not me. See, they use VTEC to meet noise and emissions rules as well as improve horsepower throughout the rev range. Here's the modal sin of the 6th gen. They removed the gear-driven cam systems in favor of the chain-driven cams, which killed off that distinctive whine everyone came to know and love about the VFR. You got this really nice bodywork, this cool dual exhaust, but they removed the supercharger. I mean, the uh, gear-driven cams. In any case, you got 107 horses at the crank with optimal power at any given RPM thanks to the advanced fuel injection in the VTEC system. The VFR had begun to lean more into the touring side of things with the 7th gen 2010 VFR 1200F. Great bikes I'm sure, but there, there ain't much to talk about. The VFR 1200F began production in 09 with a completely new engine, also later used in the VFR 1200X, which was like the uh, dual sport adventure type. For the VFR 1200F, the design was almost purely functional, <laughs> not looking nearly as good as the VFR 800 that came before it. The engine was single overhead cam this time around to change the positioning of the engine, and that's a strategy that we've seen Honda use to improve the center of gravity of bikes. We've also seen Honda pioneer the dual clutched uh, automatic transmission on motorcycles, and the VFR 1200 was the first to feature a DCT, which was on brand for using the VFR to showcase new tech. The VFR was still packing the combined braking system up to this point, but here, somehow it seemed more appropriate. Now, I'm not alone in hoping that the VFR would return to its more sport-focused origins, but for what it is, the VFR 1200 was a great next-gen sport tourer, and it pumped out a healthy 170 horses. Now, the VFR 800F of 2014, or the RC79, was more of a return to the sporty form featuring modernized bodywork reminiscent of the fifth generation of the VFR. Was introduced in 1983, the Honda Interceptor changed the rules of sport bike design. Featuring a race bred chassis and V4 engine, the groundbreaking Interceptor expanded the boundaries for high performance motorcycles. The 2015 Interceptor extends the legacy of innovative performance and refinement thanks to its remarkable balance, broad ranging versatility, and long range comfort. The 800cc model was on hiatus since 2009, but this model returned with a lower weight, better suspension, better brakes, ABS, traction control, and the everlasting VTEC system. Now we know Honda definitely stretches out the, the lifespan of the engine, so this 2014 model still used the same engine and transmission from the 6th gen from 2002. Good enough, I suppose, but not quite anything to write home about. But I guess that's what the VFR was destined to become from the start, as it was never really Honda's flagship sport bike. It was a sport tourer. You know, it can handle it, it can handle twisties, it can take you from state to state, and Honda pretty much remained true to that to this day. Now, with that said, who can really blame them? The masses want this sporty modern V4 from Honda that isn't $200,000, but that's really not what the VFR is. In fact, the VFR always had an actual V4 race bike running concurrently with it. That being said, I think the 1990-1997 VFR 750 is the most pure and most awesome VFR, though ironically, it's the one with the biggest identity crisis. That's the one I'd like to have, but uh, the great thing about the VFR is that no matter which one you get, a uh, year, generation, displacement, you're still getting an overbuilt Honda that will get you across county lines and back home with a smile on your face like a true Sportora. And that's what really matters here. So here's to the VFR. Thanks for watching.